In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sat down and talked with Durga Prathap, or Dr. GD as he's like to be known, India's first blood flow restriction training instructor. He's a physical therapist that's spearheading the adoption of blood flow restriction training in India. And our conversation focused on his journey, as well as the important barriers that still exist preventing the long-term adoption of blood flow restriction training in India. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic, or my real name, Nicholas Rolnick. I'm here today with Dr. G.D. or Durga Prathap, as is, I'm hopefully pronouncing it right. Um, his, uh, his quest in being the uh, first BFR instructor in India. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation because um, there are certainly similar barriers that exist for the implementation of blood flow restriction that we probably share as educators, but also different barriers to um, between uh, India and the United States. So I'm really looking forward to uh, digging in and having a conversation about all things BFR. So today, we are going to be talking about blood flow restriction. So Dr. GD, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. I know it's a little late where you are and um, and really just appreciate your time. Why don't you just tell the uh, listeners and the people that are watching this podcast um, on their devices, who you are, how you got into BFR and your journey towards becoming India's first BFR instructor. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, thanks for inviting for such a wonderful event. And uh, it's my first uh, podcast uh, as well. So I'm not sure how good I'm going to talk, but I'll be talking like uh, talking to my friends. So uh, hi, hello, everyone. And at once, uh, Merry Christmas. So uh, I'm Dr. J.D. Pratap. I'm a physiotherapist. And also I worked as an assistant professor for three years. So uh, during my uh, bachelor degree, uh, it was like uh, 2010, 9, this kind of this period. So no one knows what is BFR. Uh, in fact, uh, I was working as an uh, as a uh, gym trainer. So we have uh, we had a guys who used to prepare for uh, bodybuilding competitions. So these guys were tying the different materials. I don't know where they got to know about these things. So to do the pumping of the things, you know, when uh, they are near to the uh, stage performance days, they do not have the enough energy to do pull the heavy weights. They are in uh, carbohydrate depletion. So apparently they use the high reputations with low load. So, but that was not uh, mentally satisfying or uh, giving them that kind of metabolic uh, stimuli. So they were reducing the blood flow to enhance the pump and they were enjoying it. So it, that's how I got uh, this kind of exposure to the BFR. So I started using the straps, uh, whatever available uh, uh, in the gym. So we felt really good pump even with the straps, but we didn't know what it is. Uh, what what is the actual science behind the uh, these kind of changes? But of course, one thing was uh, uh, obvious: the pump was insane, and we able to get the uh, very good uh, the failure even uh, with the less load. So uh, afterwards, then uh, after website was updated, I, I hope it is it was in uh, 2016. And some when I was doing my master degree, we were uh, able to receive some uh, research papers from the US, uh, Joe's PT, I hope. Uh, so I could see the BFR. Then I was uh, trying to make the uh, kind of similarities I could make. Uh, okay, uh, BFR actually the things uh, which we were doing without knowing what it is. So then I got exposure to the BFR. Uh, and you know, in India, uh, it's like uh, whatever the Western world in uh, in a way it comes at least ten years to fifteen years. Then only we got to know the about things, and then we started practicing. 
and uh, by that time us started doing the things differently so uh, to be honest we follow the things from the us uh, less likely you uh, the things from the uk uh, my uh, all kind of exposure everything from the the us based curriculum so the bfr something is which uh, which i was so much fascinated as being a, a, a gym trainer being a physio so uh, you know we were not having any idea where to go and learn the stuff you know so being a zero ground zero person uh, i try to learn the articles research papers especially your paper i have gone through a lot though so uh, i i used to follow you and the guys who were so doing the bfr the muscle phd guys okay then i got to know more so much exposure with that then i started doing the it was a pandemic. Uh, we were able to do the lot of presentation on webinars to make the awareness about the BFR. Then later on, we access to get the manual variations of cuff, probably generation one cuffs, uh, which, which is very simple and uh, economically soundful. Then uh, I started giving the lot of pre-courses. You know, it's very difficult in India to uh, adapt new changes. Uh, you know, people here are... Uh, transforming their profession into chiropractors, uh, osteopath. A lot of passive therapy, therapeutic approaches are in peak. So introducing the exercise medicine with the BFR, it is it is really out of the box. So I know that, but the future is really bright towards the exercise medicine. So I kept doing the uh, seminars, talking to the people uh, to make the awareness about BFR. Uh, you don't believe many people are doing research on BFR without knowing what is BFR. Uh, yeah, so uh, sometimes I may think like, uh, you know, I want to do a lot of research in BFR, but uh, the biggest issue being a clinician is uh, quite hard in India. You know, uh, probably uh, uh, some of my friends, they are working in Canada and US. They say we, we treat uh, six to seven patients a day. Uh, that is a big day for us. But in India, we have uh, 80 OPDs, uh, OPD, I mean, 80 clients. Uh, we are just eight people to man, eight, six to eight people to manage the uh, kind of cases. We have the at least 15 to 20 cases to take in care daily. So uh, as a director of my clinic, so I have to do the consultation, everything. So it's quite hard for me to do writing the paper and that. So, but in future, my uh, aim is to do the research on BFR. So now being a clinician, I'm uh, teaching BFR. I know that my target is uh, to teach the, the young physios who just uh, completed their bachelor program. They wanted to try something new because it was really hard for me to uh, teach the, the physios whom are already having the experience of 10 to 15 years. They already adapted different kind of model. Uh, it's very far, for them also, it's very, very difficult to adapt the new changes. So this is how it's going. And uh, uh, yes, we have the gym. We have the personal training uh, uh, gym. And also we do strength and conditioning for athletes. So myself, uh, we are actually... Uh, we have the uh, Olympic weightlifters. We have uh, we are we are giving the warm up protocol using the BFR. Uh, we are doing the metabolic conditioning using BFR. Uh, we have the marathon runners. We try to do the intermittent occlusion training. This kind of new things we are trying so far. And uh, one thing for uh, I would like to share here the recent thing which we have tried is uh, BFR for sciatic pain, acute sciatic pain. Uh, it looks like a little kind of uh, caution or contraindication in this area, but uh, having the uh, analgesic effect, pain uh, reduction effect, or you can say uh, it changes the pain perception during the BFR. Uh, BFR having the strong uh, anti-inflammatory effect, I could say. So, uh, you know, in I'm, I'm a neurophysio basically. So uh, we study about the uh, neural in inflammation in radiculopathies. So when nerve buds are having the inflammation, so something you need to try to do to reduce the inflammation. So this kind of pressure with the training uh, kind of is like uh, flossing the nerves in between um, the muscle structure. It has the really good effect. We had a uh, uh, very good results uh, within a three days patient pain and range of motion 
and the SLR test become negative with the BFR. So since it's a single case model, so we are trying to explore it further. But I would say uh, tendinitis, uh, where you might be having the pain during the training, with the BFR, we were able to give them training without pain. So there is a strong uh, uh, pain, uh, I mean, changing the pain modulation effect is definitely there. And this kind of new things we are added up apart from the regular hypertrophy and rehabilitation after ACL. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear about your experience and some of the similarities for, for me getting into the space, like me first coming into BFR with the bodybuilding lens, um, as you kind of mentioned it. The bodybuilders love this technique because we're able to maximize the pump. And, and part of the reason why, you know, the BFR pros is tagline is hashtag chase the pump is because we can really get a nasty, nasty pump with very low loads and mimic that higher intensity training environment. Um, so me being a, a bodybuilder, competitive bodybuilder at that time, anything to increase the the chance of putting on muscle size was always something that that was very intriguing i just had no you know idea about the underlying physiology more so than hey i'm going to you know occlude blood flow and exercise and it's going to give me that sick pump um so that was kind of how um our journeys are are very similar and then in terms of your experience in educating other clinicians, like what, what you mentioned, like the healthcare system, it seems is set up a little bit differently than it is in the United States. Um, I definitely will say there are physios um, or physical therapists, depending on how you want to use the abbreviation, that do see you know, 15 to 20 plus people a day. Um, so that's definitely a similarity. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to see one person an hour, but I'm very, you know, I'm, a, I'm on the rarer side um, just because of the, the way that my business is structured. But what are the, um, the biggest barriers for blood flow restriction implementation in India. So like you can have like the education, but there's so many other factors that go into it. Even if BFR is very sound and, and safe from an implementation perspective. So I'd love to, to hear what those barriers that you're encountering are. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, uh, if you say like in India, uh, the orthopedists, like the physiotherapist who works with the orthopedic patients, they do get the referral from orthopedic surgeon. And uh, in fact, they most of the orthopedicians, uh, surgeons, they write the protocols. Like uh, you give ultrasound, you give the SWD, uh, you give the LWD, this kind of protocols they give. They also say, uh, go for the isometrics, uh, go for the uh, eccentric exercises, okay? And half of the physio, they do follow them uh, because they work with the hospital setup. They work closely with the orthopedician. So they don't try something new. And uh, so in such a situation, if we if they wanted to try BFR, of course, the surgeon's supposed to know about the BFR. That's the biggest thing. You know, so far, I know only one surgeon in India, he prescribed, especially he's from Mumbai. Uh, uh, probably he's from, uh, he did his fellowship from USA, probably. So he already knew about the BFR and he especially wrote that particular athlete, you should go undergo BFR. You do not have time for uh, your game preparation. So you need to quick up the muscle gain. You already lost. Uh, he was having the irreversible changes in his VMO after the surgery. That was uh, giving him trouble during the uh, running. So that guy especially contacted me when I went uh, to Mumbai. I gave him the personal session about the BFR. So uh, this kind of barrier, like, you know, uh, the healthcare system doesn't have the good communication about the recent updates. So the, the Kumsor I'm educating, uh, I always tell them strongly 
uh, it's our responsibility to bring the science to the another community, especially the orthopedic surgeons. You know, uh, one thing, most of the students, they are fried even after completing the course. Uh, what if we do restriction of blood flow, uh, anything mishappening or something? Uh, I always say surgeon always, they restrict the blood flow to the maximum before doing the surgery. So for, uh, for hours. So we are, we are having the strict, strictly following the protocols and with the uh, very good uh, calculation of LOP and all, definitely it, it don't cause any damage. So I tell this to them to make them more comfortable to do work on the patients. And it's like a first wave of BFR just a first wave so to reaching to the people to the maximum i hope uh, india is the very big country and so far i'm the only one guy is keep promoting the exercise and bfr uh, so there are guys who actually works on the snc strength and conditioning and rehab so kind of guys they should also come forward to promote the bfr so reachability is the biggest factor here uh, and next thing is the affordability um, uh, the availability of the cough, everything, we do not have any, uh, uh, in, uh, not, I mean, made in India product about the BFR. We have the straps, you know, many of my students, they are still using the straps to do the BFR. Okay. So I, I teach them uh, uh, seven out of 10, you need to tie, uh, you need to uh, keep working on the occlusion cell swelling. This is the only parameter you can uh, watch out for the uh, straps. So they're still using that and perhaps using that, they're still getting the good results, uh, patient satisfaction, and they could see the acute cell swelling and you know, psychologically also they are getting kind of, um, they are doing something good, you know. Uh, so in a rehab setup, it's, uh, you know, if, if someone having the, the private clinic, uh, they do not have the bigger uh, uh, setup for rehabilitation. They may have, they may invest more amount of money for the electrotherapy or manual therapy. They don't invest much money on the exercise setup. That's the biggest issue in India. Uh, why and why, most, why uh, is that? Ah, that's that's why. You know, the, now you know, uh, exercise is just getting popular. Exercise prescription is getting popular. Before, what they do is they just uh, um, give the hands out of the exercise, ask the patient to do at home. If the shoulder pain patient comes, I do dry kneeling, I'll be mobilizing the shoulder, I release the muscle, I send the patient home, do this kind of exercise. So definitely patient don't do exercise. So believe over the exercise also not so strong. So, but it, this thing's changing. People have started believing on the exercise. Why? Because uh, we are in a, uh, high competition with the gym trainers. You don't believe gym trainers are treating the ACL surgery. They are training the, uh, you know, they do always the extra, extra things. So physios are like, you know, I don't want uh, him to train my client. So better I'll update. I try to do something. So this is how now people are having these small, small exercise set up inside their clinic. Before it was not. Five, 10 years back, I never seen some good gym with the clinic. Uh, and India is not spacious, <laughs> though. So there are a lot of uh, things to be considered. Um, yeah, I mean, but... I guess for me, it's it seems that there definitely is a similar barrier for education, um, particularly with the surgeons. My experience in the United States is... And it's changing now. Like I think the biggest the biggest issue has been with a lack of awareness of the importance of maintaining muscle mass following an injury or following surgery. And the strategies that are currently being implemented are just not sufficient in being able to create this anabolic response in a very catabolic state. So the, so what ends up happening is we're just resigned to having that atrophy and promoting in essence, that anabolic resistance, which sets us up for a challenging long-term recovery. And so that awareness now is starting to change and the change is being brought about in the United States, at least because physicians now are seeing the benefit of using blood flow restriction, 
not only in their patients, but they're also reading in physician journals, like arthroscopy, like OJSM, like all of these other physician targeting journals that, oh man, BFR, you know, taking with, with what the podcast name is, is really better for results. Like we're getting better outcomes with our patients. And with that awareness has now triggered, at least again, in the United States, the physicians being more open to implementing blood flow restriction, because now they're seeing, okay, the technology is there in the United States with regards to we're, we're ha we have more access to automatic technology. And I think that this mirrors the growth, the growth of BFR is mirroring what normally happens where we have this, this interest that slowly accumulates. Remember to anybody listening and familiar with BFR, the, the legend goes that Yoshiaki Sato back in the mid 1966, 1967 type discovered, um, discovered Katsu training and over a decade plus was experimenting with it. And then it really only reached the United States in 2012 through Johnny Owens, who was seeing some efficacy in helping the amputees get an increase in, in muscle mass when traditional means weren't able to. So that, so now it was initially starting out with high barriers, which were the technology. This technology in the United States was using a retrofitted surgical tourniquet device, the Delphi. And then that was, you know, prescribed as, you know, being the safest way to perform blood flow restriction. And then now we're getting manual cuffs which we pump up manually that were like the lower portion of the affordability curve, which again, I'm interested in hearing um, how that kind of process goes in India. And now in the last two years, the automatic sector of blood flow restriction in the United States has really taken off. So now we're, we're coming across cuffs like smart tools that you're able to connect the device via your phone and bypass the manual, um, the manual determination of, of personalized pressure that now it's becoming more affordable and it's validated technology. So BFR now is even in the span of five years, the cost of these devices are coming down and down and down. So now clinicians are able to implement these, the, the, this piece of technology because they, before it was oh, you need to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars, which even in the United States, even in hospital-based systems that have the money to be able to do that, it's very challenging to be able to do, to do so. So I think that now the physicians are becoming more aware of the benefits of BFR and they're becoming more comfortable with using it. And so my, you know, my assumption or, or observation is you know adoption of any sort of new technology spreads fast slowly so like it's now just picking up steam so a part of what we do in our course is talk about the science of how ideas spread and you're basically kind of talking about that in in a microcosm of you know of india because you're saying hey i'm the actually the first Indian physio to be able to go about and spread the idea of BFR and it's and it's happening but it's happening very slowly and you've been doing this for a couple of years now right yeah uh 2019 uh, yeah, I so was, I was... Been, yeah so it's been like three to four years and how many physios can you you know recall that you're you've trained over those three to four years 400 400 to 500. Yeah. How many physios are there in the whole, you know, uh, the whole country of India, you would say? Must be uh, three, four lakhs. So what is that? Is that thousand? Three, four? Uh, I think in uh, like uh, 100,000? Yeah. What uh, is... 100,000 is the one lakh. Okay. So 300 lakh. to 400,000 physios. Oh, no 
And yeah. your four years of education, you've educated about 400. Yeah. So you're, you're in, you know, you're what I would call, or what, um, what we kind of teach a, as the, the actual science of how ideas spread, you're an early adopter. And so you're trying to, you're teaching all of those physios that are looking for the next best thing, the, 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 the innovative technologies before everyone else. So you're in essence shepherding that growth in India, but it's going to be interesting because as we're kind of seeing in the United States, once there's a critical mass that that of, of people that are aware of the technology and are, are benefiting from its use, you're going to start to see it's all of a sudden now going to cross this critical threshold that um, will then be considered mainstream. And it takes time and it takes consistency. So especially if you being the only one that's really going out there and, and, and spreading the word, kudos to you. Um, Cause that's, that's a, uh, that's a big, uh, big endeavor that you got in your hands. Yeah. It does. So, um, so yeah, so, so like that's kind of, at least to summarize, you know, we've kind of have similar barriers, but a little bit different. Um, you mentioned the economics of, of BFR and how a lot of the, the clinicians you're, you're teaching are still only able to implement straps. What, so let's, I guess, talk a little bit about that cost barrier. Do you think that it's ever going to get to a point where, um, the majority of people that you educate are going to be able to afford pneumatic based products like what is the i guess help contextualize for the people outside of of india that are listening like a typical let's just say a typical cuff that you would buy in the united states would be between 400 and 600 us dollars okay that would be like a a mid-range cuff yes you can get cheaper but typically that's where uh, that's where some of the clinicians are are spending their money on. So how how does that how does the economics of that mm, differ yeah. in India in Indian culture and society? Where I don't know too much about the economics, but I definitely know that there is a difference in currency uh, relative to the U.S. dollar. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to hear about that because that's a you can't do BFR without you know, cuffs of some sort. Yeah. So the problem is uh, we get cuffs from the uh, abroad, outside of the India. So uh, the cuffs are not so costly, to be honest. People can afford, but the, the tax is like 28 percentage. We have to pay the tax and the courier charge. Everything makes it little worse. Like you have to pay 50 percentage over the actual price. So uh, for an example, uh, for Indian, uh, like I mean, uh, the physio, the pressure, they approximately makes, uh, uh, I mean, thirty thousand rupees per month, twenty to thirty thousand per month. The fresh graduate, uh, so cuffs are somewhere around fifteen thousand in hand. Um, like if you ever to get, wow. So, so that's almost a month's salary. Yeah, for most of them, it's a month's salary. Uh, like if you are in the urban uh, setup, like if you're in the cities, then your salary will be a little higher. So 50 to 60 percentage of your, at least your money ha you have to spend for your cuff. Wow. That, that is significant. I can no wonder why people are, are going and using straps. How much do straps cost relative to? Uh, it is just uh, like, uh, hmm. 400 rupees, 400 rupees. Okay. So yeah, significantly different. Six, um, six yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's probably the, the biggest barrier overall is even if physicians are aware of, you know, the benefits of BFR to be able to implement it in a way that 
I personally feel we should, which is via pneumatic devices. But I, I kind of understand that there, there is limitations in order to implement this. So what do you tell your clinicians that you're educating when we personally, you know, the research has shown that we have a very difficult time uh, relativizing any sort of pressure with a perceived pressure scale. So the research out of Jeremy Lenke's lab was basically saying that, and they use pneumatic devices for this, but you know, it's still kind of apples to apples where I don't know if you're familiar with this paper, but they basically had individuals come into the lab over three days and they blindfolded them and they had them pump up cuffs in the arms and the legs. And they basically said, all right, well, I want you to replicate this pressure at a seven out of 10 uh, magnitude. And their results basically said that you that they the participant on any given day over or underestimated their applied pressure as much yeah. as 25%. So for us working with individuals that for me at least this is my bias and I'd love to hear yours um it, or you know your approach I tend to want the clinicians that I am teaching to implement objective and reliable based applications for BFR and the most reliable and objective is using a relativized pressure. So I want to know kind of what you teach the Indian physios, given that the majority of them are probably going to be using straps. What safety precautions do you take? Are you, are you having them take what screening precautions and, and what are you having them look for when they're exercising or doing something with the straps, given we know that you were, were pretty, that seven out of 10 perceived tightness is going to vary on, a, on an application to application basis. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's it's quite challenging uh, to give the individualized to pressure and, uh, you know, teaching the clinician and this, these clinician going to teach the patients. That is, the clinician should have some knowledge about the pressure, but of course, the, the patient might not get the things what actually we need to do. So we usually teach like if you are uh, tying too tight, you probably having the ischemic kind of pain immediately after your tying. And also you may probably getting into uh, numbness or kind of uh, temperature changes in your arm and all immediately. And we don't need that kind of pressure. And the pressure, if it is too low, and you don't feel like you're getting the pump even with the 10, 15 reps. So we need to keep the things in between where uh, probably 15 to 20 reps of light load would gives you the kind of pump. Uh, you Your veins are getting bulge up with the after some reps, rather bulging up immediately after uh, tying. This kind of small, small uh, practical examination uh, we shall be able to give them. And also, of course, chasing the pump is the uh, one of the next things to do sometimes you may not have the uh, exact pressure or these kind of things but uh, if you are able to get the failure uh, especially metabolic pay failure with the good cell swelling and per personal experience when you do over and over you get the kind of momentum okay this is how we will be doing this kind of experience uh, we have we have to give them that's kind of things i do when the world cups are not available how how important do you think it is to actually get a personalized pressure? Okay, uh, for an example, like we uh, have the uh, patients, like we have the season, uh, whenever the football season is on, we get the quite a lot of injuries. So most of the partial tier patients, uh, we start BFR within a week, you can say. And uh, some are, they go for the uh, surgery, they come for the pre rehab especially when they have inflammation and they want they want inflammation to settle down the surgeon tell the patient to go for physio get ultrasound or do some exercise so here we usually check the lop uh, uh we'll be having the progression of lop we don't start with the 80 percentage to be honest so in acute cases we'll be somewhere around keeping it uh, 60 to 70 and slowly like within a week we'll able to progress 10 mm hp a little higher side 
and up until reaching the 80 mm HP. And of course, in uh, some cases, in acute cases, we be using the no exercise multi ligament, especially when you have the MCL tear along with the ACL, the knee is really worst condition. And surgeon asked them not to mobilize. So we'll be going for the passive BFR, where we straight away we go for 70 to 80 percentage of LOP because there is no exercise is going to taking place. So this kind of things will be starting and we always believe in the uh in our practical experience i don't know about the rest of the world uh progression progression of the lop uh, can be done in many every patients so we personally feel like when we give the 80 percentage of the lop to be honest many people uh they can't adjust with that pressure uh especially they can't do the squat with the 80 percentage of lop in uh, uh first go so to adapt the LOP also taking time in our experience. That's why we keep the, even we keep 50% of LOP in some cases. If the movement is larger, like a squat, uh, kind of lunches, this kind of movements, then we'll be trying to keep the LOP a little lesser side so he can perform the body weight exercise in a right way. So when we progress the 80 percentage, the movement is larger. It makes a little complicated. It takes time to adjust with that higher pressure. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. I haven't done eighty percent on a major movement in a long time, years. I think that when it first, when BFR first came out, and it, you know, eighty percent was kind of the pressure that that was adopted and shepherded as the pressure that we need to ultimately get all of our patients to. I think that there was um, there was a lot of oversight on why that might be or might, why that might not be the case. And I think, you know, for me, there's a lot of ways in which I've arrived to a lesser applied pressure in almost all circumstances. I will say that there's really only two applications that I can think of off the top of my head where... I would use 80% pressure or, or more. And the first one is if we're getting a very low, like, like amplitude movement, kind of like what you said before, where if all I'm trying to do is isometrics or I'm doing a short arc quad or I'm doing a bridge, um, something where it, there's only a small amount of muscle mass that's actually recruited and we want to maximize that fatigue stimulus, then sure, 80%. Um, the second would be analgesic response. We have evidence that already shows that 40% does not provide the same benefit in terms of analgesic effect as 80%. So if we're looking at trying to get an analgesic response in our patients, then I want to induce as much discomfort as they possibly can, because regardless of the mechanism, whether it's endogenous opioid release, whether it's conditioned pain modulation, we, we tend to see better results. And we have a paper that's currently undergoing review where we compared in the leg press task, moderate strength training. So I think we used 60% of, um, of one rep max, and we compared that to 30% one rep max with BFR. And we had individuals do 15, uh, 30, 15, 15 failure, I believe. Um, and so they were all effort matched and we found a greater um, increase in pain pressure threshold. So that just means that when we apply a, um, a pressure point to the muscle, at some point, that pressure point becomes painful. And when we have an increase in that amount of pressure that we can apply to that uh, to that person before it registers as pain, well, then that magnitude of difference is the delta of the analgesic response pre and post exercise. And so, when we're able to um, when we're able to get a stimulus that can induce that response, well, then that can be a potent tool for clinical practice. So really, those are the only two methods or, or ways in which I would want a higher pressure. Just for the listeners, right, we also know that there is not necessarily this beautiful, pristine relationship between 
the amount of applied pressure and the blood flow. And what that just means is that as we apply, let's just say 50% of arterial occlusive pressure, right? That's not 50% of the total blood flow that's getting occluded. It doesn't work that way. In fact, 80% of LOP or arterial occlusive pressure, they're interchangeable, is only restricts something like 65 to 70% of the blood flow to the limb. But yet we start to end up kind of seeing that there's this trade-off because I don't know if you've encountered this, you, you kind of said this before, but a big interest of mine is trying to maximize the adherence to blood flow restricted exercise and maximize the, the results that we're getting. And if we use too high of a pressure, we might have people that are just like, I don't want to do this. This is way too uncomfortable, right? I mean, it's, it, we have to, we have to find ourselves in some middle ground that, um, that is, is going to get us the results, but also have them do the exercise. So what are the more common things that you, you know, you're implementing blood flow restriction that you see in the, the clients or the patients that you work with and how do you work around some of those um, apprehensions to BFR or the experiences that are, that they're having in BFR. Uh, pardon. Uh, could could you please repeat? The so questions? so what are the the kind of things that you encounter implementing blood flow restriction with your clients in terms of the experiences that they have during it, their concerns, and how do you address those? So we have the two different kind of population. One is the athletic population where sports injuries and all. These are easy population. We no need to talk more on the about the BFR. They already have, have a good experience about the exercise. They know that what is pumped, what is the uh, metabolic uh, kind of stimuli they get. This kind of thing they know. Uh, what is the discomfort they shall be able to get through the exercise. But the when we use the uh, osteoarthritis, knee, post uh, THR, TKR, elderly population, we, we try to do. And we definitely will be like, they, they were so much concerned about, they do not know what it is. And uh, they already given the hands out by the doctor saying, do this all the exercise. We are going to do the, our own rehabilitation protocols. So we'll be giving them a uh, very good explanation i sometimes i use my mobile to show them the video uh, what it is like uh, schematically giving them an idea what we are trying to do what video so, you say you show them a video yeah, yeah yeah what video so we have the plenty of bfr video like in even in your uh youtube i have seen or some videos oh okay yeah just genuinely just genuinely curious because yeah we do have a what is bfr video but I, I think that's a nice way to show new clients what is, what is BFR by showing them doing, you know, other people doing BFR. Okay. So then what about like implementation? Like, do you, do you talk to them about the experience of what they're going to be, you know, ha feeling before they do the exercise? Like what, what do you kind of, you know, tell the client or patient? Uh, we'll be having the some checklist like uh, identifying the risk factors. We'll be discussing with them. And uh, my most of the concern is the uh, like uh, any bleeding disorders or pre-existing cardiac conditions. And we'll be going for the vital screening. And if, if in some clients, we'll be going for the cardiac recovery test. Like we ask them to do exercise uh, pre and post how quickly their heart rate is recovering. You know, um, we even seen a strong hypotensive effect of BFR, even in athletes. So uh, even with the right pressure, uh, the, he, he he was like yesterday it was my wife. He's a cardiopulmonary physiotherapist. She was very much uh, concerned about the EPR exercise, pressure reflex and uh, post-exercise hypotension. Um, like she encountered a patient like uh, he was uh, he was having normal blood pressure 120 um, bar 70 and uh, after the exercise his blood pressure went to 80 the systolic blood pressure went 80 to 90 somewhere so we stopped him and we given the salt and hydration waters 
so then he was able to do better you know that was the first encounter uh, for him uh, so we definitely when we are working with the elderly population we will be very very cautious about the vitals and since we are first you know if the bfr is already known to the people it's safe very effective uh, the mild uh, side effects are uh, okay to have but in india uh, nobody knows bfr so any kind of uh, the uh, negative side would not be acceptable even you do dry needling you pierce the nerve uh, hardly matters okay but uh, the post exercise dizziness this all the things may put the bad impact on the patient mind that i don't want to get the bfr again so that's why to ensure the safety we do uh, small like uh, here their uh, medical history is the very vital one even some areas are cautions not contraindication still we go for the a uh, very least pressure as possible to give them introduction give them a feel that uh, how actually things are working and in this way uh, believe me last one year uh, we trained many elderly population many elderly population they especially ask for bfr they are ready to pay extra money to get the bfr now without exercise without bfr exercise don't feel like engaging for them you know the bfr the, the pump the kind of things it gives uh, is psychologically also it play a huge role for them to stick back to the protocol one thing we have to always keep in mind is um, we also ensure uh, least pressure as possible without discomfort initially slowly when they adapt the go more you go they don't feel much uh, difficulty so do you think that we need to prescribe a personalized pressure for everyone when we're exercising with BFR. I'm very much interested in this for myself because I think that, well, I'm not going to tell you kind of my, my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours regarding, do we absolutely have to take arterial or limb occlusion pressure every single time with every single person and if we do, why? And if we don't, why? Okay. Uh, six months back, we we'll we had a, a different scenario. In clinic, I put up one uh, big board where I wrote uh, 100 when the patient comes, 100 to 120 first few weeks. Then you go for the 120 to 140. Then you, you can progress. If the leg is really larger, you can go additional 10 mmHp. This kind of information I given them, okay? Because uh, we use the BFR for many cases. So it was very difficult for us to assess the LOP and all. So me and my wife are having the self trial. Uh, in some athletes, we check the LOP within, uh, uh, within a month, three times we checked, three to four times we checked. LOP is changing. LOP is really changing. Uh, when we checked the first week, I mean, the first week of training after this uh, surgery, LOP was different as the muscle is responding, growing, and the vessels are opening up and getting the little bit of muscle thickness. And after four weeks, the LOP is different. So then I, my personal opinion, uh, especially post-operative cases, every few weeks once is testing the LOP is a really good deal. Because uh, I don't know how much it impact the results of the, uh, I mean, training. You know, sometimes uh, if you have the 10 to 20 mm HP is lower side, if you do five reps extra, you feel still you are, you are getting the failure. Okay. This kind of things also there. But uh, whenever it is possible, it's okay to test, especially post-operative cases, elderly population to have the safer side and effective. FTNS also you'll be ensuring also safer side also so a uh, few weeks once getting the personalized LOP is good that is how we adapted recently before six months we were not doing that because uh, limitation of uh, number of uh, Doppler we had uh, only we had uh, two Dopplers so it was very difficult for us now we have the access to many Doppler also so cuffs also we have uh we imported uh recently 50 cuffs from uk so so we have what cuffs uh we imported the occlusion cuff uh oh, from okay. UK. okay we have the uh two variations of uh occlusion cuff one is the 
a light one, which is a little smaller. The beauty of the occlusion cuff is uh, some may think it's a uh, really discomfort because of the, the width. It is typically somewhere around seven to eight centimeter width. So it is like, you know, uh, for Indian population, you can use it for the upper limb as well as the lower limb. It is like in between. So you don't need to have uh, different cuffs for the different size. It's like one fits all kind of mm -hmm. things. So this is one of the things which is uh, easy for us to use it in the clinicals. Also, uh, our clients like our, our clinicians who are completing our course are able to buy this, are able to purchase this. So we already sold 20 plus cuffs uh, in our last course. So hope uh, demand is getting better. Hope for the best. Yeah, I mean, oh, a couple of things. I think you, where I... I have very conflicting thoughts because on LOP assessment, because um, let's just go, let's just play double-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the pros in my mind of assessment of LOP, right? Number one, I totally agree with you. I understand and appreciate that the limb occlusion pressure will likely change in post-operative clients. I highly recommend every session people if they have the capability to assess lop right because the likelihood is the exercise prescription that you're going to be using with these patient populations are going to be on the lower end of the intensity uh on, on the intensity paradigm so you're not going to uh, you want to in that case you're likely going to be operating on higher pressures as much as you possibly can and the patient can tolerate you you should be creating 80 to 80% 80 or so in the lower body and that's predominantly what um what is used in the early post operative phase anyways because load is is kind of a limiter right so i totally agree with that because if we're not, if we're just shooting in the dark and we're doing something like even a perceptual scale i just i want to be as objective and reliable as possible and and that kind of goes into the technology of making sure that whatever you're using, if you're using an automatic device, that it is validated for the amount of applied pressure that it actually gives to be able to determine LOP. So I totally am on board and that's what I do um, when I teach other clinicians as well. And, and again, this is almost like, kind of like, doesn't matter because a lot of the technology, the technologies in the United States, we can just determine a personalized pressure like this. The issue becomes when you're using a lot of manual cuffs where you have to use a Doppler and you're in a busy clinic and it's like, like you're not going to be able to do that. Like I, I think that the data pretty much suggests, and I've done work on this, right? I was involved in a publication that, um, that we basically looked at and said, all right, if you have between a nine and a 14 centimeter cuff, right? Where we took, I think it was like 74 people. And we basically looked at, at um, the relativized pressure in all of those individuals. So we looked at 60, 80, and 100. And then we used, we said, all right, well, let's overlay that with a commonly used arbitrary pressures. So things like 100 millimeters of mercury, one times brachial systolic blood pressure, 1.3 times brachial systolic blood pressure, 200 millimeters of mercury. And we wanted to say, okay, well, if you don't have access to a Doppler, but you want to kind of put yourself in the ballpark for what a relativized pressure should be, given you have a cuff that's between, you know, the nine and, and, and 14 centimeters, or something along those lines. Um, well, we found that about 100 millimeters of mercury is around 60% of the limb occlusion pressure in the lower body. And we also found that 1.3 times the brachial systolic blood pressure tends to be a good estimate for that person's limb occlusion pressure. And then we found that 80% of limb occlusion pressure can be a good surrogate to that could be about their brachial systolic blood pressure. So that, so that to me, at least if you're not using a Doppler for assessment and you have a cuff that's within that cuff width, 
that you could be able to put yourself in the ballpark to at least you know ensure that you're sub occlusive or you're you're giving a relativized pressure within that range and of course if you're not using a doppler the most important things that i think you should be doing is monitoring for numbness i agree you know you kind of said that as well monitoring for numbness tingling um things that yeah like when you apply bfr you're going to be compressing blood so it is going to feel tight right there is going to be discomfort but there should never be numbness that's that's occurring if that's the case then you got to lower the pressure but also monitoring pulse so you're going to the distal um the distal arterial tree so looking at the posterior tibial artery that's behind the medial uh, malleolus so you go to the inside bone and you come hook your finger around make sure you're feeling a pulse if you're not feeling a pulse with whatever pressure that you're applying it and that person's at rest the, the cuff is too tight right? So then you have to deflate. These are all simple guidelines that if you don't have access to a Doppler, right, at least you're using research to frame your implementation of blood flow restriction. And that's why it, for me, circling back to the question that I asked about the importance of assessment of limb arterial or occlusion uh, arterial or limb occlusion pressure or arterial occlusion pressure is that, you know, I want to be as objective as possible, but I'm fully aware that particularly in other um, less economically fortunate countries that getting a Doppler or getting other, you know, pieces of technology that are available that are pneumatic, even like, you know, in Brazil, some of my colleagues, we just finished an aerobic training study that we're using blood pressure cuffs, right? Yeah. So, so like these are all not made to restrict, you know, blood flow during exercise, but it's the best that they can possibly have given the economic circumstances. So my goal as somebody who's very passionate about blood flow restriction is making sure that we're able to grow BFR safely within the economical realities that exist in various parts of the world. So for, for, for you, for example, I would not have any issue whatsoever if, if, if somebody's going to come to you and basically be like, Hey, Dr. GD, like I, I want to do BFR, but I have a blood pressure cuff and you know, it's, you know, 12 centimeters, you know, in diameter. Um, you know, what can I do? I don't have access to a Doppler. I can't buy one. Well, at least you can point to a body of research that says, hey, well, you know, at least let's try to be as objective as possible with our application of blood flow restriction so we can at least put ourselves in the ballpark. Because like you said, we can start off somebody at 100 millimeters of mercury and we can say, okay, well, that's probably putting us in the ballpark of about 60% of the limb occlusion pressure. And then over time, you know, we measure, we're taking blood pressure. So we understand what their blood pressure is. So then we say, all right, well, let's, let's do our brachial systolic blood pressure for 80%. And we kind of can adjust our pressure prescription without absolutely being tethered to a Doppler. And that's really why I like having conversations like this is to find out where BFR is in, you know, it is expensive, right? People go to a course and they're like, well, all right. It's not like, you know, dry needling has a little bit, uh, you know, more that you're buying needles, but like a manual therapy course or something where, you know, you're just using your hands, then you can implement that on Monday. But with BFR, there's an added expense. So I, I, I totally understand. And I just think that, you know, to, to, to at least go to the flip side and um, uh, of this, right, we know that if you apply too little pressure, that it actually doesn't accelerate the fatigue process, right? So you need to hit somewhere between 50 and 60% of the limb occlusion pressure, according to a recent review by one of my colleagues, uh, Mikhail Sequera, that was published in the journal Strength and Conditioning Research that says, hey, we need that amount of pressure to meaningfully accelerate the fatigue process. But to your point, right? It might not even matter if we're getting our patients to exercise to volitional fatigue, 
right? They're getting too, they're getting the stimulus of BFR, but then they're exercising so much that we're getting that, we're unlocking that access for them. I think for me, where AOP or LOP may matter more is if we're doing things like four sets of 15 or the traditionally recommended 30, 15, 15, 15, where they're not going to failure, but we wanna get them as close as possible to failure. So we wanna make sure that we're applying an objective stimulus to be able to get them close proximity to that, right? Does that kind of make sense and resonate? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting because we also know, right, that if you apply more pressure, it's going to increase the perceptual and cardiovascular um, yeah. responses. And like you like you said with your wife, where she's working in the cardiopulmonary uh, arena, that we may not necessarily want to stress them at least significantly. If they're not if they're not ready for it, so having a relativized pressure and understanding, are we hitting the minimum value there? And if we are, great. We may not need to proceed any higher from the the difference in in uh, pressure will increase the exercise pressure response, and thus will potentially expose these patients to higher than needed blood pressure for whatever reason. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So then yes. my question is, right, is, and I would love to hear your thoughts about this, right? My statement that I'm going to ask you is, or say, and agree or disagree, right? If you're safe to exercise in moderate to high intensity exercise, right, domains, you're safe to do BFR. Agree? Or disagree and why i i agree uh i agree so uh, this is the, one of the biggest question i come across when i teach the students okay uh they ask me like uh, uh how to say out loud bfr is safe okay so i say if you're able to your your doctor saying okay to do exercise Okay, you know, the elderly people, they do have their own intensity of perception and athletes they do have and the normal population, they do have their own. So moderate, many people, they do high intensity interval training, moderate cycling, these all the things, right? So uh, how we are ensuring safety? We are not doing the BFR with high intensity exercise. We are doing the BFR with moderate to light exercise. In most of the condition, we do light uh, low intensity of exercise. That's how we are ensuring the safer. I won't say like, you know, uh, do BFR with the plyometrics. Okay, definitely. I don't think so. It is uh, it's going to be easy. Our high intensity interval training with the BFR, you know, most of the population, maybe pro athletes, they may can try, but normal population, even I tried, to be honest, uh, I was having like, you know, painting. I, I was, I blackout, this kind of symptoms I could be able to experience with the moderate to high intensity of BFR exercises. So uh, making sure that we are giving the exercise that where, where, where the patient can do moderate to high intensity, at least moderate intensity, but we are still doing the uh, low intensity with BFR. It's a super safer and also the additional screening we are doing so to ensure uh, more safer and effective. So, so the reason why I ask that is because I think that there, you know, everybody is, I think, how do I say this? I, I've become more convinced, right? So, so follow me along with this. So if exercise, in general, is prescribed as a non-pharmacological intervention for almost every single condition that we're going to encounter as physios, right? And we want to get our patients the, the highest stress that they can tolerate and recover from that's safe, okay? So if you have an athlete that comes in, they're cleared to exercise regardless, moderate to high intensity, no problem, right? But I guess for me, it then goes, okay, well, what are, and you touched on this earlier, when you say the differences, what are we doing with blood flow restriction, right? We are taking what's in essence a tourniquet 
and we're applying it to a limb and we're having people exercise with it. But we're using some sort of pressure scheme that's hopefully subocclusive, right? And we can better ensure that for at-risk patients by using a personalized pressure, right? If I'm working with a bodybuilder that's that's highly trained, I personally don't think we need to really worry that much about relativized pressure because these people are going to be lifting with heavier weights. These people are going to be more hopefully physically conditioned. And at the end of the day, we're exercising for five to 10 minutes with a low intensity, albeit physiologically stressful bout of exercise. So my question is, are we being overly cautious with our screening procedures for blood flow restriction? Because if we're really applying it in a five to 10 minute scheme for low intensity exercise, and we currently know that even in high inten- uh, uh, relative to high intensity strength training, blood flow restriction in hypertensive patients approaches or maybe slightly exceeds high intensity exercise, but is well within physiological limits, right? Because if we if 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 we say, all right, well, a bodybuilder or somebody that's lifting 85% of their one rep max, instantaneous systolic blood pressure is about 480 over 350 for diastolic. That's peak. Right, that's not sustained, but but whatever. So if our if our blood flow restriction exercise with single leg extensions or whatever, it gets a little bit more uh, higher with multi joint. But again, I don't really do much multi joint exercise with people outside of machines. But that's my own bias. But my question is, right? If if we know that there's going to be a heightened blood pressure response, but it's not going to be to the same degree as, as what we would do if we were lifting super heavy weights, what, what is the safety concern with exercising with people, with anybody with BFR, right? Obviously there are certain things like open wounds or, you know, common sense contraindications, but diabetes, hypertension, obesity, Exercise is listed as a frontline intervention for all of them. So why would blood flow restriction be any different? Okay, uh, this kind of, this is a good question, actually. Like, you know, sometimes we think too much about the safety, safety. We undervalue the things uh, where we are not so much confident in progressing the BFR protocols. So uh, as an instructor, uh, what I say, I would like to share, like uh, I used to say uh, to my students, I like when you are a beginner in a BFR, so you'll be having the learning curve. So you'll be so much into the uh, uh, checking the screening, contraindication, this, all the things. So as you are getting little maturity over the years or over the months, slowly you'll be cut off. Like, you know, initially I even, I'll do uh, LOP assessment, other screening for bodybuilders. So later on, I know that, okay, bodybuilders, okay, not gonna, I get, I get the, some kind of experience, uh, perception about the, how BFR is impacting their blood pressure and how they are cooperating with that changes. So I don't worry. Maybe after a few sessions, I say, okay, it's okay. Next bodybuilder, when he comes, I'm not going to check the assessment. That's how I get mature. So now, uh, Honestly, we are we are we are too much bothered about the elderly populations, uh, not much about the middle age or or people like athletic population. We don't bother much. We'll be having the little kind of interview kind of things to ask the brief about the medical history and especially kind of a bleeding disorders. We always ask for look for because you know in India some people even uh, they don't get it tested or worry about the. Uh, bleeding disorders and uh, and also like uh, I would like to ask you also some like uh, would you ask the questions like uh, people are in the anabolic steroids uh, are birth control pills likely to increase the thickness of the blood uh, we 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 in certain scenario we used to ask like are you on any pill any medication for a prolonged time uh, so for the safety and ensuring the things 
And also, you know, most of the cases, they do have the blood report where we can check their cl uh, clotting time and other stuffs, uh, for especially post-operative cases. So that's how we ensure, okay, we are in the right path. Yeah, so I guess I'll answer. Um, I, uh, I don't necessarily think that anabolic steroids or birth control pills are contraindications to BFR. In fact, I... I really have grown fond of, and I teach now with the Australian Institute of Sport screener. Um, I, have you ever seen that? Not, not, not. Okay. So I, I would definitely recommend checking that out. I think that it is probably the best. I keep on returning to this. So like, I, I initially was like, hey, on my perceived barriers paper, the funnel algorithm of like going through and checking, I was like, oh, that's good. But that was also just theoretical, like thought processes that you should be going through, like screening for blood disorders. Like I do think that that's important. But um, the more and more I learn about BFR and physiology, the less and less concerned I am that it's that it's a safety issue. Um, for almost anybody, even those that have had a history of, of blood clots in the past, the, the evidence that we have suggests that BFR does nothing or is slightly beneficial to the clotting, you know, the, the anti-clotting mechanisms. So there's, at, at worst, there's no effect. And so like, especially with the five minutes, 10 minutes duration, I'm not really that worried. So the Australian Institute of Sport screener has really four absolute contraindications and all of them have to do with arterial related issues. So I think if I'm recalling correctly, an arterial, um, uh, like an arterial, a vascular surgery. So you have vascular grafts, um, arterial insufficiencies, which that's the one that we're actually learning can actually, BFR can be a therapeutic way to yeah. create um, additional microvasculature to reduce the hypoxic state, which is super cool. And other, a couple of other like arterial related um, stuff like venous insufficiency as well. Like that's something that seems like um, I probably wouldn't wanna do a lot of blood flow restriction on somebody who has venous insufficiency because of the difference between the arterial um, architecture and the venous system architecture and the architecture of the arterial system being more, um, being more, uh, muscular and the venous system being more collapsible. And so when we have sort of insufficiency or the valves tend to, um, uh, be stressed more, or we have a system where the valves are already stressed, I'm probably not going to do as much BFR. But the Australian Institute of Sport basically goes through and it's a handout that you can give a client and they can fill it out and basically will give you talking points for your assessment as you screen them. So it goes through all the major ones. And I, I, and I initially was like, eh, but then the more I learned about BFR, the more I'm like, wow, actually, I really like this to the point that I actually teach it in the courses that I give because it provide it's not overly aggressive. Um, the screeners that have been published in the past, like the, even the ones that I was on the, the, the paper with, uh, Dahan Nascimento in frontiers and physiology, the, uh, risk stratification for blood flow restriction exercise and rehabilitation paper. That was a little bit conservative. Um, but at least it was a starting point. This kind of, screener is is a much more conclusive way to screen so if you're watching this listening to this you can go to the australian institute of sport website and type in blood flow restriction and it'll have that screener and it's definitely a good way to get to the nitty-gritty of of things that may matter for uh potentially increasing risk of bfr exercise but with that being said what, um, what, so I don't necessarily believe to answer your question that anabolic steroids or, um, or, uh, use of contraceptives are absolute contraindications because we do know that BFR has negligible impact on the anti-clotting mechanisms. 
And if that is kind of the main concern about those individuals, I'm not really as concerned uh, about that. But again, you have to take the picture of the client as a whole into you know in into consideration. So if it's a person that has obesity, diabetes, um, is borderline hypertensive and is taking oral contraceptives, well, then maybe I'm probably going to be less likely to implement BFR in that person just because of a common sense approach to, okay, maybe I probably won't want to do that. But if I'm dealing with a CrossFitter who's on oral contraceptives, who's super healthy, I'm not even going to, that's not going to even bat, that's not going to even matter to me. And I, I just think that a lot of the issues that come with BFR are due to a lack of, of understanding of physiology and what's going on when we're temporarily restricting blood flow. And I, you, you mentioned it earlier, we're not doing this massive restriction of blood flow like they're getting a go into surgery for 45 minutes to 50 minutes, right? So it's, it's a completely different stimulus. And if you're not able to tolerate five minutes of restriction, then you are extremely, extremely unhealthy. Uh, I mean, I, I, that's, I firmly believe that. And so it's, uh, it's up to us to say, all right, well, if that's not something that we can implement with this patient, maybe we can return back after that person improves their health profile or whatever. I think there's a lot of clinical judgment and you, you touched upon that too, that learning curve and being okay with people that have comorbidities. It just so happens in the United States, 70% of individuals are overweight or obese. I think the prevalence of diabetes is like 10% or maybe even more um, in the United States the last time I checked. So people are going to come to you as, as, a, as a clinician with these comorbidities. So you just have to be comfortable with implementing it. And that's where adhering to guidelines like the assessment of limb occlusion pressure, particularly in clinical populations, is really you know, important. Um, and then obviously the use of that technology, right? So the question I'm going to have, I want to ask you is what are your biggest safety concerns with the use of blood flow restriction and how do you, uh, you know, teach other clinicians to minimize those? So you, you kind of mentioned blood clotting, um, but what else, what are the other safety issues that you're, that are on your radar for when you're implementing BFR with your clients or teaching others about BFR? I can't hear you, you're mute, son. Still. There we go. No, now it's no. Yeah, there we go. We're good. Now it's back. Now we can't hear you. Still, still can't. I don't know what's going on. Is it? Okay. Now we're good. Okay. Good. No, well, that's crazy. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. I can... No.
That's that's there we go. Wait, maybe. Can you Yeah, now. What? Now it's still out. Should I come again? Yeah, there we go. Okay. My so my the, editor will will edit this out, so it's all good. Okay. So the biggest concern is for me is the varicose vein. You know, uh, varicose veins are the more common among the late, I mean, uh, older adult people. And you know, I likely I always feel like you know, few one or two small varicose vein. I don't worry, but I often see. It's getting bulging ba badly when we are in the occlusion. What's your opinion on that? Like, how you see varicose vein as the uh, caution or contraindication? What's your yeah, practice? I mean, I think it's a clinical judgment. If they're sporadic varicose veins, I'm not that concerned. That's just the sign that there's some sort of venous, you know, issue going on. Um, I, uh, I just, you know, am. I'll take photos every two weeks and kind of adjust adjust the plan from there. If I notice that the veins are getting worse, then we'll stop. But yeah, it's really just a uh, a way to kind of check the you know it's it's a risk it's a risk benefit, right? So like, what's the risk progression of the varicosity? What's the benefit? Well, improvement in muscle mass, strength, function, uh, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, um, let's, let's finish up with the last question that I want to have from you, which is, or ask of you is what are a couple of things that you want to learn about BFR in the next couple of years? So the, my first thing I wanted to get a uh, good exposure in a uh, different variety of the instrumentation, uh, especially the different modes and, uh, uh sophisticated instruments which is available in the united states i hope i i will if i get a chance i definitely get exposed to it and i also wanted to develop the instrument uh for indian scenario like uh, more affordable as well as the uh easy to use so you know uh, so much benefit people so many people can get benefit this is my next uh, goal to do the things and the third one is the uh, want to explore uh, improving the vo2 max and performance uh, you know we are so many papers are with the strength training i want to see like how it impact in the uh, running performance long distance running performance using the intermittent mode like intermittent occlusion uh, mode so for that, we need a special device, definitely. Like, uh, for an example, if you are occluding the uh, four limbs one by one, uh, the cup may be on the four limbs, but it will be activated uh, uh, with the sink, like a one, two, three, four, like that. So kind of different, what kind of things uh, it may impact in their running performance, this kind of things area I wanted to explore. And also, of course, uh, and inflammatory effects of the BFR, especially uh, in sciatica and uh, what we can do uh, to reduce the pain among like uh, tendinitis, acute cases. This is all the area I need to explore. Cool. So my question, my question, my last one now is, is BFR better for results? What are you finding? Fantastic. You know, uh, uh, we... We are like, you know, if you go and see in my Google reviews, uh, last one year, we are having the really good results. We are so much proud with the BFR. I I'm openly agree to it. Like we were practicing the exercise. It's like, you know, enhancing the exercise experience with the result BFR is really good. You know, you know uh, in, in uh, patients with whom so are coming to us, uh, we'll be using the 1 kg, 1.5 kg. Uh, we see the result that is not so quick and we are not so much uh, into like, giving the kind of uh, stimuli. But now we really feel that, you know, acute and chronic changes are really better. We were able to send the uh, athletes back to the trot quite early. Before it was not like within a three to four months, they are fit enough to do the trials. Now they are within a three, four months after uh, ACL, they were able to play well. So preserving the muscle mass, enhancing the uh, 
I mean, we are also having the anti-inflammatory effect. I wanted to say again and again, we we unfortunately we do not have the data, but when whenever we use the BFR, the post-operative inflammation is settling down quite faster. The scar maturation also quite faster than the uh, when we don't use the BFR. You see the the surgical incision scar is it forms the very dark and thick uh, kind of layers. When we use the BFR, BFR itself cell swelling, this, all the things, I don't know, like what kind of mechanism behind it, they have the better scar healing, maybe probably post-exercise hyperemia, improved uh, blood flow and all, giving better collagen deposition. So we have this kind of results. So definitely BFR for better results. Love it. Well, uh, before we wrap, wrap up is uh, where can people find you? Best way to contact you and plug anything you want. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I use Instagram for all the purpose. So people can reach me through Instagram. Uh, my ID is I am fit doc. Uh, I am F I T D O C. That's my ID. I'm reachable all the time. So definitely I would like to thank you for inviting me. And I learned so much from you definitely through this podcast and uh, behind the scene also. Definitely. I'm following you for years now. So it's really good to see you doing the things uh, around the world. I, I just wanted to follow your path to do the things in India. I hope for the best years to come. Well, again, thank you so much for the, the kind words. I am seeing from afar what you're doing. You are shepherding this technology in your country and uh, doing it the best way you can. So props to you. And uh, thank you again for coming on and talking about how BFR is better for results, as well as the challenges that you had during your uh, during your time as instructing in, in BFR. So thank you very much. And uh, that's the end of the episode, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.